I'd just like to say, stop it. Did you hear me? Stop it. Don't you know that Arabs love their conspiracy theories? For over 100 years, Arabs have leaned on conspiracy to justify their geopolitical shortcomings and strategic failures, especially in terms of Zionism and Israel's resounding successes. Whether it was the Balfour Declaration, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the British Mandate or the partitioning of Palestine, many instances scream conspiracy. The West, though, sure doesn't make it easy to believe otherwise. It's the West's fault, actually. The West keeps feeding the world with tangible proof to the contrary, that there is something foul in the air, keeping that fire alive. And it's not just rumor or subjective stuff that they generate. No, it's real, official, and hardcore evidence that is black and white. That official discourse that is referenced and quoted by various government institutions and their leaders. The topic of this video is a prime example of the Western conspiracy fodder that is reflective of a bias in blindly supporting Israel at the expense of Arabs, regardless of the means. We'll be dissecting a product of the Institute of Advanced Strategic and Political Studies titled A Clean Break, a new strategy for securing the realm. I'm going to jump into a quick digression from the outset. The last word. Realm. Really? You're going to start the conspiracy theories even before we have a chance to go through the document. Why use a word that has connotations beyond a single country or nation? One that is more conducive of a group of nations that has a monarchic slash imperial twist about it, like a kingdom. Securing the realm? Whose realm? Israel's realm? Anyways, who is this Institute for Advanced Strategic and Political Studies? I'll explain briefly as it's not the institute that is important, but more critical are its members who are the real eye-opener. The institute was an Israeli think tank based in Israel in the 1980s, but with a more important and critical office in Washington, D.C. The members of the think tank who would be responsible for the generation of a clean break was comprised of a group of seven that would include many up-and-coming neoconservative politicians as well as academians who most, if not all, happened to be a Zionist. Richard Pearl was an assistant secretary for defense in the Reagan administration, and later on in his career, and under George W. Bush, would serve as the chairman of the Defense Policy Committee. Pearl, throughout his professional career, would be accused by the FBI of being an Israeli agent of influence. At the beginning of his career, Douglas Feith would work in the Reagan administration. Feith would also soon follow his mentor, Pearl, into George W. Bush's second administration as an assistant undersecretary for defense. Feith, after an investigation by the Pentagon's inspector general, was accused of fabricating intelligence claiming Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. David Wormser is one of the leading neoconservative thinkers who first became a special assistant to John R. Bolton at the State Department in the late 80s and early 90s. By the turn of the millennium, Wormser was appointed as a foreign policy advisor for Vice President Dick Cheney. This was the profile of experts who represented the larger team responsible to research, recommend, and write the main ideas of the Clean Break proposal. And in 1996, triggered by the newly concluded Israeli elections when Benjamin Netanyahu's surprise victory came at the expense of Shimon Peres. And upon Netanyahu's becoming Prime Minister for the first time, the Institute would prepare a study that would correlate with Netanyahu's campaign agendas and ambitions. Its main intent was a new approach to resolve Israel's security issues as well as realize its larger strategic aspirations. A clean break suggested a new vision based on a reinvigorated Zionism that took a position of power and in parallel abandoned the previous policies in achieving peace by Israel's more idealistic leaders. The clean break proposal wouldn't take long to generate and one is surprised at how short a document it is. Six pages long, to be exact. But in hindsight, looking at what came out of these six pages would be totally devastating. I've added a link in the video's description below to the entire proposal so that you can read it at your leisure. So what I'm going to do in this video is break down the document into its two main parts. First, the regional security strategic measures, and second, the peace process extract their major findings while also addressing each consequence. The report proposed producing 
a chaotic dynamic in the Middle East, with a focus on targeting Israel's more capable foes such as Iran, Iraq, and Syria, as well as their proxies. Israel could create imbalances in security throughout the region, where Arab neighbors would lose trust and confidence in each other and seek alternative strategic defense relations with Israel to maintain their own security, a situation when Arab and Muslim nations turned on each other. The report identifies Saddam Hussein and Iraq as a main threat to Israel and recommends his overthrow and replacing him with more friendly Arab leadership such as the Hashemite leader King Hussein of Jordan. Seven years later, the United States would create a false mass hysteria about both Iraq's destructive capacity and their involvement in 9-11 that would see an all-out criminal invasion of the country and destruction of all semblances of Iraq's stability and integrity. As an immediate neighbor to Israel, weakening and striking Syria and making it a target for all Western powers was a major component of the report. This strategy would put into question Syria's territorial integrity and would hence greatly diminish the threat it posed onto Israel. In 2010, through the aid of the CIA, major support of Syrian opposition started to take shape and by 2011, all-out revolution would be triggered. Since then, the Syrian regime has lost control of almost 40% of its territories, as well as deteriorated greatly as a political and military power in the region. Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel. And like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases. The second part of the report has to do with the abandoning of the peace process. The report labels the peace process as a failed endeavor. Israel's approach had been misguided and submissive in its strategy. Such previous tactics, the report says, undermines Israel's legitimacy and has crippled the nation in achieving its aspired intentions. It was time to abandon the process, as it was known, and to introduce a more powerful and re-energized Zionism to the nation. The first approach that the report suggests when dealing with the peace process is to cancel the idea of giving up any land to achieve peace. This is 1996 we're talking about, three years after the Oslo Accords that set the foundations and expectations for a two-nation state. The report vehemently recommended withdrawing from such a principle and to take a position of strength by maintaining all land as rightfully promised land. The report suggests that the PLO wasn't delivering on its commitments from the Oslo Accords and diminished the PLO's ability to engage as a partner for peace. The proposal was for Israel to cultivate alternatives to the PLO as a group representative of Palestinian interests. Alternative groups did exist at the time, and one that gained power and momentum in the mid to late 1990s, a group admittedly supported and propped up by the Netanyahu government, was Harakat al muqawma al islamiya also known as Hamas. In the report, it is explicitly mentioned that Israel should not respect the lines drawn during the Oslo Accords when guaranteeing its security and political aspirations, as in the principle that Israel can, at its will, infiltrate Palestinian-controlled lands to serve any purpose. Such a practice would be totally justifiable and looked favorably upon by any United States administration. Increased kidnappings, evictions, incursions, and assassinations would shape the updated IDF policy and aggressively and inhumanely dealing with the Palestinians. To lay the grounds for a more powerful Israeli negotiation position, the report recommended the relocation of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This move would put the Palestinians and Arabs in a bind since it forced upon them a new baseline reality. Jerusalem would then become, as per America's conclusion, the capital of the State of Israel. Just over 20 years later, the U.S. Congress would approve the Jerusalem Embassy Act, thereby contradicting the United Nations resolutions concerning the fate and existence of a Palestinian Jerusalem. The new Peace for Peace process mentioned in the report established a strategy for negotiation. The previous counterparty for negotiating peace was a unified Arab voice that denied relations with Israel. But if a newer methodology of a one-by-one nation-by-nation negotiations was put forward to the Arabs, then maybe better results would be realized. Enter the Abraham Accords of 2020, 
which saw the establishment of relations with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. In 1999, Netanyahu lost his momentum upon his loss to Ehud Barak in the elections. The next election saw Sharon replace Netanyahu as the candidate for the Likud party and again postpone his representation of extremist Zionist agendas. But by 2009, Benjamin Netanyahu would return and gain a stranglehold on the Israeli premiership. And since then, much of what the clean break proposals listed seemed to have entrenched themselves into our existence. Was it all a coincidence in how the outcomes of the times aligned almost exactly with the recommendations of the think tank report? Or was it a surgical implementation of a well-calculated strategy by Netanyahu and his allies, the neoconservative US political leadership? One additional fact to note was that as much as the report was intended for the eyes and ears of the Zionists in Israel, it became a working blueprint for the US administration from 2001 to 2009, and even beyond. In the United States' strategies and dealings with the Middle East, shaping its policy, converging all its efforts and taxpayers' money towards the interest of a foreign Zionist nation. Let me just replay this. So an Israeli think tank with an office in Washington, D.C., hires a group of Jewish American politicians and academics aligned with Zionist policies to create a strategic blueprint for an ambitious Israeli prime minister. And somehow, less than 10 years later, the same members of that think tank would then be granted the political appointments and consequential trust of the likes of the president, George W. Bush, and his vice president, Dick Cheney, to propose policy and military engagement in the region. I mean, if that isn't conspiracy right there, I don't know what else would be required to constitute conspiracy. We see it today more powerful than ever, the influence of the American-Israeli Zionist lobby. IPAC, the ADL, and others king-making their way into influencing the outcomes of the American democratic process while assuring that their political agendas are protected and realized through belligerent and in-your-face campaign finance contributions. But it's always been this way, since even before the establishment of the State of Israel. Zionist lobbies using their influence, money, and power to change an outcome and reality by hook or crook. This document is a tip of the many icebergs that reveal the extent of Zionist influence on many supposedly autonomous Western nations. Six pages of political strategy and proposals can appear like a bit of inconsequential political lingo, but much of its recommendations have found their way into reality, and frighteningly so. No one should be able to contend this, so how can one say that this is conspiracy? Unless we want to term what has been written in the Clean Break Report as prophecy, a divine foretelling of what was to come, like in a promise of what was to be, the same way in which Zionists reinvigorated the narrative of the promised land and the promised people. Then, of course, no one can question this promise through rational means, not the Western powers, not the United Nations, and definitely not the Arabs. <laughs>